I'm the executive director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and we serve all students with events like this, our programs, and our competitions. And if you want to find out more about what we do, you can connect with us on a variety of social media platforms. A lot of you are already there, but you didn't come to hear me speak. I am going to ask a friend of mine, Mona Nee, who is a senior electrical engineering student who is currently on a team that is in our Venture Lab program. So they're doing some really interesting things in the nonprofit space. So Mona is going to come up and introduce our speaker tonight, and then you're in for a treat. So, Mona. Okay. Greg Glyer is the founder of Donorcy, an app that lets you help the world's poorest people directly in seconds, and then proves it with raw videos. Greg graduated from Grove City College in 2012 with his bachelor's degree in entrepreneurship. In his time here, he took first place in both the 2011 Ele Elevator Pitch Competition and the 2012 Business Plan Competition with his idea, One Sonogram. From 2013 to 2016, Gret lived with the world's poorest people in Africa, where he built more than 100 houses for the homeless and famously crowdfunded $100,000 to build a girls' school in rural Malawi. Gret has been featured in USA Today, National Review, and the Huffington Post. He speaks regularly on charity, poverty alleviation, and, third, and the third world. For more information, you can visit his website at gretglier.com. So please join me to give a world, warm welcome to Gret Glier. Hey guys, it's a really uh, big pleasure for me to be here. Um, how many people know what they want to do with the rest of their life? Like they know every morning I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be excited to do this thing. <laughs> All right, you raise your hand, so go ahead. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Now that you know I'm going to call on you. Okay, anyone else? Entrepreneurship, cool. All right, so um, I'm going to give some background on myself, and then my goal today is to help you understand um, how you can find your purpose in record time. I want, I want to give you guys the most high-impact ways so that you can find your purpose, the thing that gets you excited every single morning. Find that as fast as possible, faster than any of your peers. Um, but first, let me introduce myself. Um, some of it you already heard. I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia. I grew up in a very wealthy uh, zip code. It's one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country. And I went to a private school, and I had all of my education paid for. And I was, uh, I was, I was very uh, well off. I was uh, very spoiled, you could say. And um, I, w I did that till I was 18 years old. I went to a Christian school uh, in middle school and in high school. And uh, then I went to another Christian school, Grove City College. Um, and it was at Grove City where I first um, began to think about things outside of uh, just my immediate sphere. So what, I, what I'm talking about is there's a lot of people who live on this planet uh, who live very different lives than us. I call this the fish tank principle. So um, we all have this, this fish tank. We all have these people around us that we interact with on a daily basis. And it's very tempting to think that most people on the planet re resemble the people who are most immediately around us, right? So if we're, if, think of it like a fish in a fishbowl. Uh, that fish is swimming around, and he's seeing a bunch of other goldfish. And that goldfish might, might feel like, you know what? I think everyone on the planet is a goldfish that gets regular feeding and ha has clean, clear water. Um, and... The reality is that there's, there's sharks out there, there's murky waters, there are predators, there are, there are people, there are other fish living in other parts of the world that, that don't have nearly the same, uh, the same upbringing as that specific goldfish. And so that's when I started, so it was at Grove City where I started to be exposed to some of these things. Um, and then uh, I graduated, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I kept hearing that Enterprise Rent-A-Car is like good for your resume. And I was offered a job at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and it was like on their management track, and so I took it, um, and I wasn't sure what else I was gonna do anyways. Um, I had like a few uh, different entrepreneurial things I was doing on the side, um, but nothing that was like a full-time thing. So I worked at Enterprise, and um, that, was, that was an interesting, shocking experience. Because at Grove City, uh, you know, you go to classes for like two and a half hours a day, 
And then the rest of your time is just like free time the whole week. And you have to like read maybe, but like apart from that, you're, you're like only in class and maybe you, you have to like come to one of these things for extra credit assignment. But besides that, like you're not really, uh, you, you're not, your time's not, not as consumed. So when I'm at Enterprise, I was waking up uh, and I was going to work before uh, the sunrise and I was coming home after sunset. I was working over 12 hour days in the middle of winter and it was, it was just like, Brutal. Like I didn't realize that people had to work that much just to like pay the bills, um, and so I did this for six months. And in six months, um, I was promoted, and I had a really nice. Um, I, I was able to have a, a management position right after six months, and, and that was uh, that was a good situation because any work I didn't want to do, I could just pass off to the people below me. So. <laughs> I liked that, but I was really nervous, and I didn't want to do um, I didn't want to do entrepreneurship. Sorry, I didn't want to do enterprise for the rest of my life. Um, and so I started looking into going overseas. Um, I had I had been thinking about this concept that the, there are people who live very different lives than us. And so um, I started applying to different mission organizations. I thought of um, there's you know the, the World Race. Uh, there were several different um, agencies that I applied to, and nothing was a good fit. There were people who didn't want me. Um, to be with their organization, and then there, there were organizations that I didn't want to be a part of what they were doing. And so I kept looking, and I kept looking, and I kept looking. And eventually, um, I kind of got uh, depressed, I got, I got upset, um, because I felt like, like, you know, what's the deal? I'm trying to serve God, I'm trying to do good with my life, and, um, and God's like keeping me in this, in this job that I, I don't like, this like horrible 12 hour a day job. Um, and I just felt like it wasn't fair. I was like, if you're serving God, like it should be easy. Everything should be should just like fall in place after that. Um, and so uh, some time goes by, and I kind of get into further and further despair. <clears throat> and I remember this one time I was um, uh, I was driving home from a church event, and um, while I was driving home, this is this is like a this is creepy. So I, I'm driving home. I'm, I really. <laughs> always listen to music um, and I always have the windows down in my car. That's how I drive. Even in the winter, I turn the heat all the way up, I put the windows down and that's how I drive. But for whatever reason, this time I was in, um, I, was, I was in my car, just silent, uh, listening to nothing and, and the windows were up and the odometer, the trip odometer says 94.1. That was the last time that I um, that was the last time that I had hit the trip odometer. And so I've got, you know, I've got a very numbers-oriented brain, and I'm thinking about this number 94.1 over and over and over again. And I, I don't know like, um, what caused me to do this, but I had this, this inclination that I should turn the radio dial to 94.1. And I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and in the Washington, D.C. area, like every Every station, every number has a, has a station of some kind. There's some kind of signal coming through everything. It's a, it's a really crowded airspace. Um, but 94.1 had nothing. There was, it was just clean static. And so I'm listening to static in my car for a couple minutes. Um, <laughs> and, but for whatever reason, I, I thought, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And as I'm listening, um, a, uh, it's, it's just static. And then, like, like really quickly, this in crystal clear too, this song lyric comes on. And I had been so, um, so nervous and depressed about my life and what I was trying to do. Um, and I, I had been praying to God, like, you know, can I have like a sign or something like that? And I, I felt like I was experiencing all of this silence. And then uh, I'm, I'm driving, listening to static, and this, this signal comes on uh, with the lyric, don't you worry, child, see heaven's got a plan for you. And then back to static. And, um, it was in that moment that I kind of realized, like, I don't know what the, what the future holds. I don't know exactly what I'm going to be doing with the rest of my life. But I do think that God has a plan for it. I feel like he just told me that. And in, in that moment, whenever, if, if you've ever been in an experience where you've, like, you feel like you've seen a miracle happen, like, right in front of you, whenever that happens, like, right in front of you, you always are just convinced this is a miracle from God. And then because we live in a hyper-rational culture, and even you see this, you see this happen in the Bible too, the, the, the longer that time gets extended be, away from the miracle, um, the, the more the years that pass, the more you say, you know what, um, uh, I'm, I, you know, maybe, maybe it was just a coincidence. You, you start rationalizing what happened. But at that, at that moment, I felt like this is God speaking to me. And so um, a few uh, months go by, and the opportunity to move to Malawi just kind of fell in my lap. 
and um, I was at a wedding and someone told me that they were going to Malawi and they need a math teacher and I was like, I'll be a math teacher and then I went, a month later I, w I had like quit my job, got my shots and I was on the plane to Malawi. And that was, um, and so I'm, I'm in this brand new country. Malawi, uh, okay, has, does anyone like, who's heard of Malawi before today? <laughs> That's not bad. Um, that's really not bad, but most, most people I talk to have, have not heard of it. It's a country in Southeast Africa. Um, if you know where Madagascar is, uh, Malawi is kind of like inland of Madagascar. And um, uh, so I spent, I, I originally went over there to be a teacher, and uh, the longer that I went over there, the um, more I realized that the thing that I'm really passionate about, um, the thing that, that gives me a lot of meaning in my life, is serving those who are living in extreme poverty. People who have just, Lives that you can't even imagine. When I, when I landed in Malawi, it's, it's uh, two of the three years I was there, it was, it's, it was ranked as the poorest country on the planet. And um, like, it's like a different planet. It like, is, like you, you land there and you feel like you're somewhere just unimaginable. Like, you've, like you, this is, it's just, it just doesn't feel normal. Um, if, especially if this is what you've grown up with your whole life. Um, so I landed in Malawi, and I, I'm a teacher at the beginning, and, and the more the time goes on, the more I, I realize that I really, like, it's nice being a teacher, but I really want to spend my time serving the poor. I really want to spend my time um, helping people in destitute poverty. And that's easier said than done, right? There's a lot of uh, complications when you want to do something like that, but um, over time, I, I found out some, of, some things that work, and um, so, like... Uh, Mona said, I, I started a, a housing ministry that built um, houses for orphans and widows. And I also, um, uh, the, the last year I was there, I crowdfunded a, a girls' school. So, um, so that was my time in Malawi. And then, um, at the, but the, the more that I spent time doing these, um, these little crowdfunding campaigns that I was doing, the more I realized that there's something really powerful about uh, technology right now, and there's there's a whole there were a whole bunch of things that were happening at the same time. Um, one, I was producing videos uh, of my time over there, and I was realizing, you know, I wrote so many blog posts when I was over there, and I like they made zero impact. Like you can you can write a blog um, and send a blog back to your friends in America who have never been to Africa before, and they might not truly understand um, what's going on over there. But if you can show someone a video, and if you can tell them a story about a person's life, you can connect with people who, who have no previous experience with that. So, so I, there, that was going on. Also, I was noticing um, the continent of Africa has a billion people on it, and they're coming online faster than any other continent on the planet. Like the, the, the um, acceptance rate of people using the internet in Africa is just growing so fast. Um, and so I thought, that, I thought that that was interesting. And then the other thing I realized was there are a lot of charities out there in Africa um, who, are, who have really nice offices with uh, um, amazing air-conditioned uh, facilities, and they have the, the most pristine SUVs that they drive around. Um, but, but what are they doing with all of that? And, and there were some uh, charities that were doing an excellent job, and they were really alleviating uh, poverty uh, from people who needed it. And then there were some charities who it's just like, it seemed like the only thing they cared about was their own survival, their own comfort. Um, and it's not a popular thing to talk about that, but the more that we talk about the, more that we talk about the um, faults of uh, broken charitable systems, the more poor people are helped, right? It doesn't, it doesn't affect us either way um, if we, if we uh, talk about a charity that's, that's not effective. Like as, as donors, as people living on this side of the world, it doesn't really make a difference whether or not a charity is being effective. effective. But um, for the people who need help, uh, that's one of the best things you can do. So I was, I was noticing all of these different trends, and that's when I started DonorC. And so DonorC is an app that helps you uh, see where your money goes when you donate. So let's say there's a girl in India who needs hearing aids, and uh, because she's deaf, so a donor uh, go, opens up their app on their phone, and they find this girl, and they, they donate the $150 or whatever it costs to uh, get her her hearing aids. And then a few days later, they get, that donor gets a video of that girl hearing for the first time. That's the, that's the concept. And we do that with all sorts of different stuff. It's not just hearing aids. It's, uh, we do sustainable development. Like if you want to buy chickens for a family in Malawi, you, you donate to them. And then a few days later, you get a video of the, of the family getting their chickens for the first time. Um, and, and a lot of times, the people who are receiving the funds, um, the, sorry, receiving the chickens, they say, you know, uh, thank you, Professor Sweet, for your donation. That was really nice of you. They say it directly to you, and, and you get a video of that. So that's, that's what DonorC does. And that, I give you all that backstory to, um, to 
to start my presentation, mm -hmm. which is, uh, your purpose is the framework through which you make every decision. Um, wh when you guys think about, I, I know that you guys were, there were a handful of you who raised your hands. There's a handful of you who know what you want to do with the rest of your life, and I applaud that. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that you guys are, are looking at that, but, it's, but the vast majority of people in this room have, have no clue what they're going to do. When I was your age, I had no clue, like literally no clue. I, I knew like kind of entrepreneurship, um, but like I don't know what that's going to look like. So I just kept, I, I, I applied a few rules ruthlessly, and those rules helped me find my purpose rel relatively fast. And my hope is that if I share these rules with you, then you can find your purpose even faster than I did. Um, but your purpose, the, to give you a definition of what it is, it's, it's the way that you make every decision in your life, right? So when you uh, wake up in the morning, how are you going to spend your day? You all have to wake up tomorrow morning. You all have to spend your day a certain way. So what are you going to do with your day? How are you, how are you going to spend your time? Um, you probably have, especially I know at Grove City, you guys have like a lot of different opportunities. There's always someone who wants to do something. And so um, your, knowing your purpose gives you a framework for how to know which opportunities to accept. So I've got a few examples. Um, the first one is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, I, I've got a few examples of people who have a, what seems to be a pretty distinct purpose. So Mark Zuckerberg, he wants to make the world a more connected place. And I've seen old interviews of him and where he's talking about, um, he's talking about uh, his, see, like someone, at, an interviewer, interviewer will ask him, hey, Mark, like, what, what are you going to, if you weren't doing Facebook, what would you do? And he's just like, he thinks, and he's like, I don't know, I, like, I just, I'm really passionate about connecting the people on this planet. So if I wasn't doing Facebook, I'd be doing that in some other capacity. Like that's the underlying purpose behind um, his startup, which has turned into something that probably 99% of you are using. Um, some of you might be using it right now. So um, <laughs> the, the, next per the next guy is Elon Musk. Uh, and I, he has maybe like 10 different purposes. And, um, but one of the main ones is he wants to make humans a multiplanetary species. He, he thinks that uh, humans have a greater chance of survival if they're a multiplanetary species instead of a singular planetary species. And so he wakes up every morning and is pumped to work on that purpose. Um, and then the next one is a guy. Uh, tell me if you guys know who this is. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah. OK. Um, so this is a, a good friend of mine, Spencer Fulmar. He's a Grove City graduate. And he uh, graduated a couple years before me. He graduated in like two and a half years from Grove City, which is, I think, like a record. Um, and he, his purpose, he, he runs an organization, uh, a production company called Hard Faith Films. Uh, and I, I'm very impressed with what he's doing because he noticed something in the film industry. He noticed that when, whenever there's a Christian movie that's made, oftentimes things are painted very black and white. So, for example, if you take a movie like God's Not Dead, there's a Christian in that movie, and the Christian is like a one-dimensional character. He's a good guy who's working on a good mission, and there's nothing wrong with him. And then uh, there's also an atheist who is, uh, there's also an atheist who's the bad guy, and he's working against the good character's mission. And he's trying to attack the good character, and he's also one-dimensional. So there's the good character, and there's the bad character, and they're pitted against each other, and there's no curse words, there's nothing that resembles real life in any way whatsoever. It's, it's just like this nice, pristine, clean movie. And there's a place for that, right? But Spencer noticed that there was this big gaping hole in Christian cinema where, um, where they weren't representing Christian truths in real life. And so he decided that he's going to make it his mission to bring that about. And so that's what he does all the time. He, he just released a movie called, uh, uh, he had Guilt and Sentence come out. He just received, uh, released another one called Generational Sins. And then next he's working on a movie called Beast in Me. And each of them, they all have several you know, curse words in them. And, but they, they deal with, with really real concepts, the type of, you know, things that, that wouldn't normally get um, dealt with in, excuse me, things that wouldn't normally get dealt with um, in, uh, in a Christian movie, but he wants to face them head on and he wants to show it, and um, he does a really good job with that. So just to reiterate, your purpose is the framework through which you make every decision. So if you're Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you wake up every day wondering, how can I connect the world? What, what are the, the actions I can take with my time? What are the things I say no to because it's not a part of my purpose? Uh, the same thing with Elon Musk or with Spencer Fulmar um, or myself. These, we, all of us have this, this framework through which we make the decisions in our lives. Um, and so uh, I've got a, a handful of benefits that I want to express to you before we get into my, my rules that will help you find your purpose. So the first one is if you know what your purpose is, it's free. 
Um, there is, uh, you guys have uh, a host of different opportunities in front of you, and it's probably kind of hard to know whether or not you should say yes or no to some of them. Uh, there are, opportunities are abundant, especially at a place like college, and um, if you guys end up going to, a, to like New York City afterwards, or uh, uh, any, other, any other city that has a, a lot of opportunities, um, there's a lot of people who are gonna want your attention, want your time, maybe want your money, and it's gonna be difficult to know how you should spend it. And so once you know your purpose, once you know that thing that you wanna do with your life, um, you, can, you, you have a framework through which to make those decisions. Uh, the next is it's strengthening. Um, this is something, you know, I, like I said, I lived in Malawi for three years, the poorest country on the planet, and it's not like it was a cakewalk. There were a lot of really tough things that happened uh, when I was there. But at the same time, it was, um, I had, I was able to go through tough things and still wake up the next day and still work on, the th on what I felt was important work, uh, serving the poor. And even though bad things would happen, and even though you know, I would try really hard to, to help a certain situation, and I would end up messing it up, uh, the next morning I knew, okay, I'm gonna wake up, and I'm going to have, I, I'm, I know exactly what, how I'm going to spend my, my day today. And to give you, like, just to give you an, an idea of how extreme this is, I have this organization, DonorZ, I raised venture capital money for it, I've been pouring my heart and soul into it for the last two years, and if that fails tonight, Tomorrow morning, I wake up and I still know that my purpose is to serve the poor. And I'm gonna work on that tomorrow morning, even if this thing I've invested all my time into completely fails. So I, I want you guys to have the same thing. I want you guys to know what, you're, what that thing is for you. I really want that. Um, and then finally, it's confidence building. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole psychology behind, uh, behind confidence. And one of the things, uh, you know, like the, the nicer you dress, the better you look, um, these are all things that kind of help you um, walk through life with certainty and walk through life uh, being self-confident in yourself um, and caring about yourself. And uh, if you know what you're supposed to work on with your life, you can, you can uh, let, me, let me put it like this. You guys, are, you guys all have a report card, right? And you guys are all trying to get straight A's or B's or like maybe some of you are happy with C's like I was. Um, I think that when, when you, you might want to put, you might be tempted to put your confidence in your grades. You might be tempted to say, if I have straight A's, I will be so confident in myself. But the thing is that that's completely uh, shallow. The, the, the very next report card, when you have a B instead of an A, you're gonna be, um, you're just gonna be, uh, your, your, your confidence in yourself is gonna be completely shot because of, of, of letters on a piece of paper. But if you know what the underlying purpose is, if you know that you've got some underlying purpose where you're actually trying to accomplish something much deeper than letters on a piece of paper, um, then you can have something hard happen and you can still move forward with your life. And so that's, um, that's a, a third benefit of knowing your purpose. All right, so I wrote down 39 different things that can help you find your purpose. And um, I, my, this was literally, my, my original idea for this talk was literally to tell you, I was literally, this is, this is a, don't ever do anything like this, but I was going to go through each thing for a minute. And just like, that was gonna be my talk, a minute with each of these things. And I realized that that goes against like everything I've ever been taught. So I decided not to do that. Um, instead, uh, I, I decided to apply the 80-20 rule. Who's heard of the 80-20 rule? Okay, so after this, everyone will be able to raise their hand and all of your lives will be changed. Because this is one of the most important things that you can uh, understand when it comes to almost everything that you do every single day. The 80-20 rule is this concept where 20% of uh, inputs are responsible for 80% of outputs. So for example, if you're running a company, um, then let's say you have 100 customers. There's a good chance that 20 of your customers have 80% of the, uh, produce 80% of the profit for your company. Or uh, conversely, let's say that you are running a company and you have 100 employees. Well, there's a good chance that 20 of the employees are producing 80% of the productivity in your company. This has been observed uh, in a whole host of different domains, and it's also been observed, um, it's usually 80-20, but there are times when it's 95-5. But the whole idea behind it is a small amount of inputs produce a large amount of outputs. So I've got, um, so this is what, this is what the 80-20 rule might look like. You've got five clients, um, you have uh, one client produces $10,000 in revenue, one's $4,000, $2,000, $1,500, and, and $1,000. And the top two clients are producing 80% of the revenue, and then the other clients are not producing nearly as much. Um, and so 
focusing on what those two clients are and saying, how can I find more of these top two clients? That, would, that will be a huge boost to your business and, and what you're doing on a daily basis. So this can also be, well, let me get into this. Um, same thing here. This can also be uh, observed in your classroom and, and with your grades. So I have a, a hint, uh, I have a hunch that your English professors are not as good at math as your like math professors or your business professors. A lot of times they even admit that. They're like, yeah, I'm not good at numbers, so I became an English teacher. And um, the, you'll, you'll notice this in the syllabus of your, um, for your English class. So uh, a lot of times there's, and I, I had a professor, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm not gonna say who it is, but he still teaches here and I, I know exactly uh, who I'm thinking of. And um, <laughs> he has a, uh, what he would do is he would put, he would give us a quiz and we had to read a lot, and he would give us a very detailed quiz, and we'd have a 10-question quiz every week in his class. And we would have to come in, and you have to read like, in such detail to understand, um, just to get a, a passing grade on his quiz. And if you didn't try very hard and you just guessed everything, you could still get like a 50%. And so you'd have to work really, really hard to get that extra bit. But here's the thing. These, these quizzes that he gave us every single week, um, in, when, when you look at the syllabus, he, there was 16 quizzes that we took every single week. All 16 quizzes were 5% of your grade. So you could pour your heart and soul into this thing and like marginally improve your grade. Like every single week you could spend your time uh, trying to get an A instead of a, a C. And by exerting all of this effort, you still just end up um, barely improving anything. Whereas if you, if you didn't focus on that and you focus on all of the other assignments, the papers or whatever, you'd actually end up doing really well. Um, so I have a, and I bring this up because I've got a friend who has a, a book called Hackiversity, and uh, his name is Kyle Winey, and so what he does is he helps you guys realize little hacks like that that, that help you get through college. Um, like small things like that, but the, the intention of it is for you to get, you guys are spending a lot of money, um, he wants to help you get the most bang for your buck, and he wants you to spend your time in a way that's really helpful. Um, and so he has, uh, he has this book, Hack Adversity, and then he also just recently, this past uh, year, is starting something called a hack internship, where he's going to have you go to four different companies, in uh, four internships, four different companies one summer. And so you just kind of hop to different companies to quickly find out what's the, like, where, where do you work best. And I think it's a brilliant idea and something that I, I thought would be perfect for uh, this audience. All right, so back to my massive list of 39 things. I looked at this, this list of 39 things, and I said there are three things on this list that will produce the maximal amount of results. There are, there's 39 things on this list. They're all helpful. They'll all help you find your purpose, but three of them are going to be the most high-impact things. They're going to get you 80% of the way there, so I'm going to share these three things with you, and if you focus on these three things, then you will get most of the effort. That's what, these, that's what this is. Okay, so here they are. Here's the top three. These are my top three rules to help you find your purpose as fast as possible. Inoculate yourself against fear, accept personal responsibility, and invest your 20s. So, um, inoculate yourself against fear. Uh, inoculate. Do you guys know what that is? Inoculate? Kind of. Okay, so it's, if, you have, um, if you have allergies, if you're, if you're uh, allergic to dogs, and you want to not be allergic to dogs, what you have to do is you have to get shots in your arm once a week for like three years. And so you go to the doctor and he gives you little dog allergens into your arm and then you slowly build up immunity to uh, dogs throughout that, uh, throughout slowly, little by little, you're inoculated and you're able to uh, actually withstand being around a really big dog by the end of the three years because they introduce you to uh, the threat at very s small incremental levels at the beginning. And so I think that the same thing, that you guys should do the same thing with, uh, with fear. If you want to do anything that, um, if you want to accomplish anything that you're ever truly proud of, you will have to face a fear. And most people don't want to naturally, they naturally don't want to face fears. But if you can slowly introduce yourself to fears, uh, then when a really big thing comes up, when something really truly scary is right in front of you, uh, you can deal with it a lot better if you slowly introduce yourself to fear along the way. Um, so like I give the example of skydiving. Uh, several, you know, there, there are reasons not to skydive. Um, it's expensive, it's far away, uh, you know, you might have to drive really far, uh, it, it's time intensive, and it's scary. But let's say we took away all three of these things. Let's say that there's no, it's, let's say it's, it's right next door and it, 
someone's paying for you and uh, you have plenty of time. The, and the only reason you don't want to do it is because you're scared. If that's the situation, if, if you are presented with a situation and the only reason you're not doing it is because you're afraid, you have to do it. That's how you inoculate yourself against fear. Find those things that the only, your only excuse for not doing it is because you're afraid and do those things. Another example that might be more relatable is, uh, let's say there's a girl that you want to ask out and uh, you are truly terrified, but at this point it's like, why, like, why didn't you do this three months ago? You know, you're, you're still like friends with her or whatever and, uh, and you just want any, you're just like kind of afraid to do it. You have no other excuse besides that. If that's you, go ask the girl out. Like, what are you waiting for? So, uh, so there are little things that you can do to inoculate yourself against fear. Oh, by the way, if she says no, if the girl says no, uh, she will still respect you a lot, and you're going to realize it's not that big a deal. And if she says yes, then she says yes, and that's what you wanted anyway. So it's a win-win situation. All right. Um, uh, the, the next thing is avoid... Okay, so these are, these are three things more, more intentionally how you can inoculate yourself against fear. Avoid the golden handcuffs. Um, the golden handcuffs is this, this concept where uh, you, you, a lot of you guys are going to graduate from college and you're going to work for Uber and uh, you, need to, you, know, you need to realize that that's a possibility and you, wanna, you need to work against that. But some of you are very smart and you're going to have awesome opportunities as soon as you graduate. And you're, you're going to be presented with a nice job with nice benefits where you get to travel and you're going you're gonna to land in this really cushy situation with, with upward mobility and you might not actually want to be, you might not actually want to do the work. You might not actually like the purpose that's behind it, but it's so comfortable. And so we call, we call that the golden handcuffs. It's when, you, it's, it's when you're tied to something that you don't really want to do, but you're, you just, you get sucked into it because the money is good. And so when you're graduating from college, um, and, and you have a situation like that, uh, the, the goal is to avoid it. And here's, here's my, my recommendation on how you avoid it. Never, uh, you never repeat a year. <clears throat> when you're in, uh, when, when, you are, when you get your first job out of college, just like I, I worked at Enterprise, you guys will have some job that you work out of college and, um, and you're, gonna, you're gonna do it for a year. And in that year out of college, you're gonna learn like 85% of what there is to learn from that job in the first year. And then the, the second year, if you're to stay around, you're going to learn like another maybe 5%. So you go from learning 85% of what there is to learn in this first year, and in that second year, you've, you'll make a marginal improvement on what you already know. And so there's this temptation at the end of your first year to say, wow, this has been a great first year uh, of work. Now I'm going to go into my, uh, into my second year, and I'm just going to coast because I learned almost everything I, I needed to in that first year. And so my advice at the beginning of, of your career is to not make sure you don't repeat it. Spend a year learning 85% from one job and then go somewhere else where you can learn just as much, if not more. And obviously there's situations where you get promotions and there's different ways to learn. So um, you just take responsibility for yourself when it comes to uh, whether or not you should quit your job and move somewhere else. Um, and then the last thing is work a sales job. You, you, you do need, one of the best ways to be inoculated against fear is to have someone tell you no to your face. Like working a sales job is so scary. Like you go up to someone and you're like, hey, I'd like to sell you this thing. And they're like, how dare you even talk to me like that? And you're like, okay, I'm sorry. And so you go back, you go back to your boss and you're like, hey, I, I, told, I tried to sell them, but they said no. And your boss says, you need to get three no's. You only got one no. And you're like, sorry, boss. And then you go back to the guy, you go back to the customer and you're like, okay, so I, I know that you, know, you said you didn't want it, but did you think about it this way? And the customer's like even more mad that time. And so you go back to your boss and you just go back and forth and you're completely defeated. You're so deflated. But it's a good, it's a good uh, way to, for you to just understand that it's not that bad when things like that happen. And the more that you can be in front of situations and face them head on and, and uh, get told no or get, um, I, I, I use the expression um, punch in the jaw, but like, I don't mean that literally, but I mean like when you feel like you've been punched in the jaw, that's, that's a, a good situation to be in because uh, you'll learn quite a bit from it and you'll toughen up from it. Next. Um, Accept personal responsibility for your life. Uh, so, um, I love, there's, there's a guy named Gary Vee, who some of you probably should know, and if you don't, then um, you should check him out. But he has this, this really fun idea for a, a, a game show. It's where you come up with an excuse for your life, uh, for, for why you're not accomplishing the thing that you want to accomplish, and then Gary Vee says, and, he just says and over and over again. So you, you present some excuse to him, and he just goes, and, and? So, like, what is the thing that's holding you back from doing the startup that you want to do? 
Is it money? Is it time? Is it, like, wh what's the thing? Whatever that thing is, just ask yourself, okay, so what? Every single person who's ever had a startup has always faced those things and they've overcome those obstacles. So whatever the excuse is, move beyond it. Uh, the next thing is, um, even though you're the most fearless person in the world and you're not afraid of any obstacle, you still have to, uh, you still have to be afraid, uh, sorry, you still have to uh, put in your dues. Uh, success doesn't come to anyone easily. Even the people that it looks like it came to easily, I promise you it doesn't. I promise you that me standing up here like six years removed from you guys, uh, like there's, there's nothing that is truer than telling you that you're going to face a lot of adversity if you're going to accomplish anything of significance. It's really, really hard to do anything important. And so with that said, understand that sacrificing your, your time right now, sacrificing uh, your nights and your weekends and sacrificing your efforts is going to uh, it is going to teach you the true value of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then if you want to be in a situation where you are able to accomplish things, I highly encourage you to be a healthy person. Wake up every morning, make your bed, win the first battle of the day, and then uh, eat well, exercise, uh, dress well, be confident in yourself. And, and that, that's like a baseline. Like if you can't even make your own bed, if you can't even um, uh, keep yourself healthy, then how are you going to go out and change anything else in the world? You, you're not. And I, I say that as someone who wants you guys to succeed. Also, I talk very directly, so I hope, uh, I hope you appreciate it. Um, this, is, this is the last one, because um, I want to leave time for a question and answer. So, uh, in, invest your 20s. Um, I, I, I'm one of, uh, I realized this recently. I think last year was, was the big realization for me. Um, I graduated from college and I was unbelievably entitled. Like I was, I, I felt like the world owed me success as soon as I graduated. And, um, and that's an easy thing to think because when you are in an environment like Grove City or, or any kind of uh, college situation, um, you're, you know, you slowly from freshman year to sophomore year to junior to, to senior, you slowly start to become uh, more accomplished within that sphere. And so as you, as you get to being a, a senior, you've accomplished several things, people know your name, and you start to think, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty, uh, pretty smart guy. Um, and the truth is, no one cares about that once you, once you graduate, like, no one. <laughs> so... Um, so, and, and, and you know what's, what's, what you need to realize even more than that? No one cares about that. And then if you act like people do care about that, you look so foolish. So, so, so just be careful of that. Um, and uh, instead of, instead of uh, graduating and being entitled, the, well, I, I think it's, it's more important that you think about, um, uh, think about what you can do on a daily basis. Instead of being like the passionate guy, instead of being the, the person who's out there uh, like saying that they're going to change the world, actually the way that the world has changed is slowly day by day on like incremental 1% compounding interest. So I, I graduated and I spent several years trying to do these like big things that would, you know, a video that would go viral or something like that. And almost nothing ever happens that way. So um, I spent a lot of time trying to improve, Im improve my situation by 300%. And I would chase big opportunities by 300% over and over and over again. But instead of finding those 300% opportunities, the only thing, the only uh, thing that has helped me improve my situation at all is daily going after 1% opportunities. So instead of saying, instead of uh, looking for the big thing that's gonna like, really propel me forward, I just wake up every day and I say, how can I be 1% better than yesterday? And then you just do that over and over again. And by the end of the year, you actually, uh, because of compounding interest, you're actually like in a much better situation. But it takes time and dedication, and it rarely happens any way else. Um, so uh, I want you guys, this is, the, this is your homework. I know that uh, you don't know how to go to a lecture and not have homework, so I'm presenting this to you. Um, Warren Buffett is, a, is one of the most successful investors in the world. And he has, he has a, a assignment that he gives people so that they can find their purpose as soon as possible. Um, and he says, go find a piece of paper or your smartphone and write down 20 things uh, that you want to do with your life. Whatever it is. Do you want to be educated? Do you want to be married? Do you want to um, uh, travel? Write 20 things down. And then circle five of those things. And then once you have five of those things circled, 
the other 15 things on, on your list, just spend all of your time not doing those 15 things. Because most of the time, the reason we don't accomplish the five things is because we get distracted by less important things. And so um, my hope for you guys is that you can find the things in your life that you want to work on and not let yourself get distracted from those other things. So I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take some questions. So uh, if you'd like to ask Greta a question, just raise your hand. I'll bring a microphone to you. And, all right. And feel free to ask anything, like, if you want to talk about my time in this Africa or anything like that, yes. feel free. I would love to see those other 39 things you had uh, yeah, up, there. up there. But I don't want that to be a distraction for all of us. But they were very interesting. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Ben. You're going to make me come all the way to the back, but hey, I haven't done my exercise today, so I'm good. Here we go, Beth. Thank you. I haven't, I haven't, you, okay, there we go. Uh, have you read the book Make Your Bed by Admiral William McRaven? No, but I know that that's where it comes from. But yeah, I, I love that. Go ahead. It's, it's very good. I highly recommend it. Yeah, the, the psychology behind it is if you lose the first battle of the day, then the rest of your day will follow as such. So if you win the first battle of the day, the, the guy who wrote it is an admiral, so he's got military experience. So if you win the first battle of the day, then you uh, get to continue it in that fashion. Levi. Uh, awesome talk, by the way. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, so they say motivation is like showering and that it's only temporary and you have to keep doing it on a regular basis. How do you stay on track? Okay, that's a great question, actually. Um, whose tea is this, by the way? Someone gave me this right beforehand, and it's actually really good. Yeah, I'm promoting it. I, it's really, really good. Um, and also, I need a second to think about that question. So, um, the, I, the main thing is, is uh, the main thing I do, the most, the most high-impact thing, if you will, is um, every Wednesday, I talk to three guys. Uh, Spencer Fulmar is one of them, Dave Schools is another one, and Nick Freiling, all Grove City guys. We're all, um, we're all doing entrepreneurship. None of us have a regular nine to five job, and every Wednesday night at um, 7 p.m., or my time, uh, we, all, we all get on the phone, we talk for like two hours, and we give, each other, uh, we, we give each other goals to accomplish. And so it's very important that you have some kind of, uh, some kind of goal or metric that you're working, working towards. Um, so that's what I do to keep myself accountable. And then I also have, this is the sound like I'm not really a nerd, but I have a spreadsheet where I keep track of like my personal goals. And throughout the year, I have I literally have I track like the percentage uh, of how close I am to reaching that goal for that year. And and that sounds like you know like the nerdiest thing, <laughs> but like honestly, if, if you if you ruthlessly uh, focus on that, you wake up every day and you have these things that you're working towards, and, and the, the 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 goals are just hard enough that you have to challenge yourself. You will make so much progress. I would love to. Um, I would love to, uh, to, to put together a resource for you guys to, to know exactly what I do. But um, if, you, if you want something to look up, uh, Google has their employees uh, do these things called OKRs, OKR. Um, and I, I don't even remember what it stands for, but, but they have ways to track your, your progress. And you put together goals for yourself, and you track the percentage and how close you are to it. So, so just giving yourself something that, that, that holds you accountable is the main thing. Great, thank you. Another question, Alex Bailey. Um, what was the biggest challenge that you faced with creating DonorC, and how did you overcome that? Um, there's been there's been quite a few. Um, one of the biggest ones was. I mean, okay, I mean, it's like, which one do I take? It's like, it's, it's not like all glamour. It's like really hard to do some, like a startup. So I think one of the ones was, um, we, we use these aid workers to, uh, to get the stories for us, to post the pictures of the girls who need hearing aids and so forth. And um, we were hoping to form a partnership with the Peace Corps, because they have like 7,000 people in various different developing countries at any one time. And so we, we reached out to them, and instead of, um, 
instead of them like saying, hey, this sounds like a great idea, they actually banned their workers from using our platform. Um, because they, I think it was like they wanted control over like the funds or something. And, but it was just weird because it was like we were trying to work with them. So the Peace Corps banned us. Like 7,000 people within our target market just gone like that overnight. And um, so what I did was I, uh, I took that and um, I, I made a video, and I sent that video to several media outlets. And we got more press coverage for that than we had ever before. And the, like our best day on donor in terms of use, usage and number of donations was the day after all of that media came out. Still, even to this day, like that was the best day we've ever had. So, um, so using that controversy and spinning it in a way to, that usually, usually any time that there's something that really, that's really bad and that's, that seems defeating, there's usually some way to recover from that if you just like sit and think and, and let, let that come. So that, yeah, that's what I did in that situation. Yes, Tess. <clears throat> um, you have setting appropriate boundaries up there. How yeah. did you decide to do like a, how have you done that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there's different, there's different ways that that plays out. Sometimes that's in your personal life, sometimes in, in you know, a startup that you're working on. Uh, for myself, I, you know, I'm, I have to, I'm the CEO of a company, and so I have to, uh, there's, I don't have a boss. So if, if I don't perform on a certain day, the only one to hold myself accountable is myself. Um, and so the boundaries that I have to set, set in place are, I mean, like, okay, everyone, everyone is very Pavlovian. Everyone works really well with um, rewards and punishments. So I, you know, I give myself rewards and punishments based on how well I accomplish the goals I want to accomplish. Um, so yeah. Yes, Najib. Quick question on um, working on your dream. Let's say you have, um, you want to start a big company or something like that. You know, Thomas Edison apparently, or somebody who came up with the light bulb, he said he came up with 3,000 theories or tried 3,000 times building a light bulb and only two of them worked. Um, so how do you embrace failure? Do you just, um, do you just, do some job on the side and still keep mm. working on your dream? You know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if I understand you correctly, what you're, what you're, trying, what you're getting at is uh, like you've got something that you want to accomplish, but in the face of trying to accomplish that, you keep getting like punched in the gut. And that's really hard and deflating. Um, and I think the, the thing, I think it's really hard. And honestly, like, it's just not for everyone. Most people, like, a lot of people can't stand that. that it's just too hard. Um, but if, if you're someone, I mean, honestly, I like it. I like when I get like pushed down, like it, it like invigorates me and makes me want to get back up. I'm, I'm just, that's how I am. That's how a lot of people who have success in those situations are. They just, they like it. So I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'm not sure there's like a magic bullet or something. Like, I, I think you just have to be one of those people who like, who, who sees adversity and like loves the challenge behind it. Can't pull. Um, you were very successful with the elevator pitch competition and the business plan competition. What stopped you from pursuing that after college? Yeah, so again, with the, the success thing, I failed at like several elevator pitch competitions and several business plan competitions before that. I was just really lucky like the last, you know, in my senior year. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that I was working on at the time was a nonprofit called One Sonogram. And you can, for $85, you could donate. Um, so that a, la a lady considering having an abortion would get a sonogram of her baby. And then she's, at that point, she's like 90% more likely to keep the child instead of abort it. And so um, I, me and my friend Nick Freiling, who I still talk to every Wednesday, we, we worked on that together. And um, uh, the reason that we didn't pursue it is because it was just, you just have to, you have to like, be you have to believe strong enough that like in the face of, enormous adversity, you still are going to believe in this mission. And, um, and that wasn't there. Like, I still feel like it's an important thing. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for all of the pro-life advocacy groups out there. I just, neither of us had the passion to c continue with it. And so um, it wasn't, it was something that I just had to let go. I think so. Lizzie. 
Okay, so at the end, you talked about doing, uh, writing down the 20 things that you want to do with your life and circling five. Uh, what are your five, and also do those five change? Oh, man, that's so tough. I said, someone asked me beforehand, like, what, what kind of questions do you like? And I said, I like hardball questions, but that's like, if you're asking me to list five things, it's like the hardest thing. I'll give you, I'll give you some of them. Um, I think the, the main one is, I, on my first slide, I put, um, I'm really passionate about connecting people in the first world with people in the third world. Like, I, I really want people in the first world to uh, have the experience where they're able to help someone in a much worse situation. I, like, I feel very passionate about helping that uh, facilitate that transaction, um, and I think I will be for the rest of my life. But I do think like there could be a point when my um, the amount of effort I put into the cause does not uh, the the ROI the the um, the output for for my effort doesn't make sense anymore. Right? At some point, maybe the the, the solution gets solved to such an extent that you need that I'll need to find something else to work on. So I would say, as long as your effort is uh, as long as your effort um, is productive and helps you uh, feel good about what you're accomplishing, continue on in that in that purpose. But if you get to a point when, it, when where you're like you're no longer growing, you're like trying really hard and nothing's happening, then you kind of like you kind of let it go. So that's a really good question. Cedric. I have to, to be the anti-professor because that's kind of how they know me around here. <laughs> uh, unlearn all the bad habits of academia. What does that mean to oh, you? Oh, yeah. Can you, give an example? That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you give an example of how you had to do that and how it benefited you? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of, there's, I mean, honestly, there's a lot of bad habits in academia. One of the things I love about Grove City in particular is that they try and get you out of academia. Like, when I was at Grove City, they had me go to um, do business plan competitions outside of the college. So there, there's a lot of good things that they do, um, and I'm really grateful that they invited me, so thank you so much. <laughs> but, um, uh, well, so one of the, the classic examples is um, in academia, they teach you that the length of your paper is equivalent to how, uh, how um, important that paper is. So if it's a 20-page paper, that's like you think about that all the time. You think about how, like, how vital this 20-page paper is. And if it's a, a paragraph that you have to write, then it's like a throwaway a assignment. Um, one of the most important papers I've ever written is a one-page document I wrote in January of 2016 that outlined donorcy. I had this burst of inspiration. I wrote it down on this one page, and to this day, it's it's like my go-to document because it was just like it was just like the thing I, I needed to have. So I I mean that that would be an example of of, um, of teaching you to focus on on the wrong things. Great, Levi, <clears throat> round two. What are your all-time favorite books? Okay, um, I mean, it's like what category? Uh, in terms of like business, um, like four-hour work week would be uh, a, a big one. Uh, give me a second. Okay, I love this question. Um, in terms, okay, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Uh, there's a there's a book I read when I was in Malawi. Okay, I, I'm talking about entrepreneurship. I'm also like equally, if not more, passionate about poverty and charity. Um, and so there's a there's a autobiography there's a biography of Saint Francis of Assisi, who is this guy who lived in the 1200s, and he just he was born into a wealthy family, and he uh, he kind of like forsake all of it and, and lived with the poor and lived with people who had leprosy. And I read that biography my first year in Malawi, and it changed my life. Um, so that biography is is up there. Uh, yeah, and most of the business books I've read have really emphasized like the 80-20 rule. Oh, uh, how to win friends and influence people. That's going to be like the most useful thing anyone in this room ever reads. So. Good. Uh, Naj, hold on. Uh, let's see. Do we have anybody over? Yeah, I had a hand over here. Uh, so actually today in entrepreneurship in the mission of the church, uh, we we were learning uh, about uh, companies that are for-profit companies, and uh, their purpose was to create economic growth uh, in impoverished areas. And the CEOs were talking about how the only real way to help the poor is to stimulate economic growth. So, is there any like donor C programs uh, that aren't just you know giving chickens or? Uh, d but are actually stimulating some sort of education or, or growth in the hmm. economy? That's a good question. So uh, DonorSea is a for-profit company. We're an LLC, not a nonprofit. Um, and so I, I 
believe pretty strongly in that model. I think there is a place for nonprofits, but I, I'm in agreement with that. Um, giving chickens actually does stimulate e economic growth. Like what happens when you give a, a, an impoverished family a chicken is they're able to breed it and, uh, and the chickens replicate and then they can grow a little business behind it. You can see, do the same thing with all sorts of livestock. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, we have thousands of projects on our site and we do a, a whole bunch of different stuff like that. My favorite one, I'm gonna talk about poverty for a second. So my favorite one is there's this lady in Tan Tanzania named Amy who posts projects of these babies who are emaciated on the verge of death and um, like could starve any day and she provides formula milk for the babies. And that's, you know, saves the baby's lives and you can do that on donors so you can like save these babies' lives. But then after that, what do you do? You have a baby. Like you can't, like you need to do something. You can't just continue to like, uh, to hand out uh, money to that baby over and over and over again until it's like, what, out of college? So you have to create some situation where that kid can take care of itself. So um, after the baby is, after the life of the baby is saved, Amy finds a, a, a caretaker of some kind. Um, usually it's like an aunt or someone in, in that situation and, uh, pr and helps the aunt set up a business, which is another thing that you can do through donor seat. And so it's usually a, a fruit stand or agricultural stand where they're selling garments or um, uh, livestock or whatever it is. And, and so then the, the mother has uh, the capacity to produce an income and can take care of the kid whose life was just saved. So yeah, we have a, a bunch of different stuff and I, I love that you guys are learning about that. I was sort of uh, asking along the same line, uh, since you're for profit, do you plan on expanding, like starting a business in Africa and then um, yeah, promoting like entrepreneurship, some kind. Of, mm -hmm. like yeah, as much as possible, we like to uh, we like to stay away from. So the rule with um, with development, with helping the poor, is if you give someone like money or or some kind of gift, and in a month, like their life is literally the same as it was a month ago, then you've then you're not really doing anything. You're not really doing anything, honestly. And so um, trying, to, trying to create a situation where people can incrementally improve their lives from an initial stimulus is what we're, like, that's everything. So that's what we, what we focus on a lot. So we're kind of dancing around exactly what donor seat is. Could you give just a two-minute elevator pitch of what it is, how it differentiates from, like, Kiva, and yeah. so we just have a little bit more understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the technical way that donor seat works, which is um, always kind of like, it's kind of a new thing and, and people aren't used to it, but it's a two-sided marketplace. So uh, Uber is a two-sided marketplace. There are drivers and there are passengers, and Uber's job is to bring them together on one platform. Um, and same thing with eBay. There are buyers and there are sellers, and, and eBay brings them together on one platform. Donor C is the same way. We have people who post projects and who want to fundraise for their ministries that they're working on, like that lady Amy I talked about. And then there are donors who want to give in a more compelling way. There are donors who want to um, actually get the video feedback. And so we bring them onto our platform and we match them up. Um, and so that's a two-side marketplace is basically the, how, the best way to, to describe our type of uh, organization. Um, you mentioned that your job at Enterprise, one of the things that you learned from that was inoculating yourself against fear and, and that. But is there anything else that you found from that job that was really beneficial for you um, for next steps? Yeah, Enterprise was actually, like, you know, it was a hard job, um, but it, it gave me a good work ethic. It, it was my first experience with uh, the business world and, like, managing people and stuff. And so I can't thank them enough for that. Um, and it also just kind of brought me down to reality. I, I was in, in this, I was really like an entitled millennial. And so I, I graduated and I, I expected to have like this easy career where I just, you know, I'm smart, so I deserve whatever. But um, it, it made me realize like you have to work really hard. So I think work ethic and um, work ethic and just like basic business skills that are, are hard to learn in the classroom, I was able to learn that enterprise. I mean, like, the, the most simple things, like um, understanding that you have to produce more revenue than your expenses, that sounds like an like a <laughs> obvious thing, but you don't really learn it until you're in a situation where if you don't produce revenue, then you, have, you, are, you go bankrupt. So that helps a lot. You were saying that you came from um, a home that was wealthy, that was well off. Um, how do your parents feel about your mission and about your work, and why didn't you pursue what they did? Um, they are the most supportive parents in the world, and so I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I think at first, they, you know, I haven't appreciated this until recently, but my, every time my mom, like, dropped me off at the airport, she would, 
cry. Like she, she was like really hard for her to do that. But she tried to like hold it back every time too. But she still would. Um, so it, it was. It's hard for them to. It, it's hard for them to. Uh, it was hard for them to see me go overseas, like a, a fairly dangerous country, and um, but but they supported me, and I think one, the reason that uh, that they were fine with it is because I spent a year at Enterprise, and I was very successful there, and they could see that the success from working there didn't translate into my happiness, and so once they saw that and they saw the effort I was putting into it, um, they were fine with me exploring other options. But yeah, they're really great. Hi, Greg. What's up, man? Not too much. Uh, yeah. I'm really glad you like the tea. Yeah? <laughs> I actually have a business question for you. You said you like those hardball, hardball questions, right? Go for it. Okay, awesome. So I what like I didn't tell I you like so you're far... I nervous than I am right now. I am. Yeah. <laughs> but what I didn't tell you yet is that for every bottle we sell, we actually plant a tree. So, so far we've planted 2,000 trees, and I think you'll like this part. It's actually in Haiti since Haiti is about 80% deforested. Yeah. So really trying to help them out. Now, hypothetically, Greg, how do you think donorcy could apply to making the reality of like, say someone buys one of these and they actually feel like they planted a tree? Uh, well, that specific partnership would probably not make any sense at all, but the <laughs> partnership... <laughs> but... Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that said, there are like we 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 do work in Haiti right now, and there are probably things that we could do with your partners on the ground. Our goal for the next year is to have uh, 100 of our partners raise thirty thousand dollars throughout the year. So we could do something like that, um, and and we're like starving for more more of these partners. So oh, that's cool. yeah, feel free to email me. I will do that. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I'm triple dipping here. Um, let's, if I could ask about two of these for clarification. Okay. First, uh, the helicopter parents and the compounding. What do those mean? Okay, the helicopter parents, um, you, a lot of you guys come from like a, a homeschool background or like myself, private school, um, and your parents are, are very generous, involved people. And, um, and that, is, that has really done a lot for, for all of you up to this point. But when you graduate, there becomes a certain pattern has been developed where you, uh, you might still want to depend on them and they might still want to um, take care of you in the same way. And, uh, and that can actually prevent you from uh, moving forward in your life. Um, even if you have a job, even if you're working on a career, uh, the dependency that you have on your parents can, can hold you back in significant ways. Um, and, so, and also, the, the other thing is it, it, holds your, uh, it holds your parents back. They need to move on. Uh, they need to get a life outside of you. And so um, I, th I think that uh, the, the more you're able to, to rip yourself away from that kind of situation, the better. Not everyone is in that situation, but, but most people I've seen are, from anecdotally. Uh, the other one, compounding is, the compounding is the idea that you invest 1% um, every day, or, or just like the idea that, that small incremental investments compound on top of each other to produce really big results. Um, so yeah, the, the 300, instead of chasing after some opportunity to get a 300% return on whatever it is you're working on, just like just the daily like uh, focus on something that makes that something that um, produces marginal improvement over time, it will exponentially uh, get better. So that's yeah. All right, Mr. Sorsa. Hi, Greg. From what I understand, uh, you didn't come from a background that had programming in it in the entrepreneurship department. Whenever you went to create your app, who did you find to be a CTO on your team, or what did that look like as far as outsourcing for that? Okay, so anyone who's, who is not technical, but they're interested in, in doing some kind of technical endeavor, I wrote a blog post called um, how I built an app from Africa with no technical background in 11 easy steps, something like that. So you can Google that, and, and in detail, I give you how, how I did all of that. Um, the, the short answer is that um, I, I, just, I consulted with uh, people who did know what they were talking about, and I, I raised venture capital money. And so that gave me the ability to pay people who were competent and, and were able to do that. Um, and I, it's, you, just, you just have to talk to the right people. 
Um, but but that uh, that blog post I wrote has just enorm an enormous amount of resources that will help you help you accomplish that. So you did outsource. Uh, you did pay for the people to program it. Yeah, or I have the line your of team? code. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other burning questions? Got Mona. Mona. Well, you did the introduction. Of course, you should be able to ask a question. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how, how did you start uh, framing your goals when you were just beginning DonorC, and how have they changed as it's grown? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, when you're starting uh, an organization, so I was, uh, in fact, I think Mona, we were talking, we, we were at like a banquet before this, and we were having a conversation about, um, I spent nine to ten months uh, working on DonorC before I launched it. Um, so I think I, I conceptualized it in, in January of 2016. I launched it on September 26th of 2016. And the day before you launch something like that, like something you like, think about if you spend that much time like writing a book and then you just like release it out there, it's so scary. It's so nerve wracking to know whether or not people are going to use your platform or read your book or whatever it is that your, your product is. Um, and so it took a long time for me to, to be comfortable doing that. Um, I, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering how you uh, framed your goals at the beginning of Donor C and starting okay, yeah, yeah. that. Okay, so so the the first so it's, it's scary to get started, and the thing that that is important to, to learn is that you might have like this really strong vision for how you're going to accomplish your, your thing. You might have an idea for planting trees in Haiti, um, but there's going to be and that's that's a good idea. But there's there what you want to do is you want to experiment as much as possible until you find. Uh, what's called product market fit, which probably a lot of you know what that is. And so there's, there's different stages in the company, but the thing that you want to focus on is finding something that serves people really well and that they, that they, they, that they need to have. So the rule is that you shouldn't, if, if a product is 10% better than something that already exists, it will never see mass adoption. A product has to be 10 times better than something that already exists for it to see mass adoption. So with DonorC, we were like working really, really hard to try and find uh, a way for donors to experience giving 10 times better than, than anywhere else. And so that's why, so we've constantly like pushed the product to, to, to get to that point. Uh, and if, if you're just making a marginal improvement on something else, um, your, your product won't, won't spread. Well, Greg, uh, this has been terrific. I sometimes measure the effectiveness of a speaker by the level of engagement on the part of our students, and you certainly had that tonight. Uh, our, I think our students would probably stay here for a long, long time to ask you questions. So we'll, we'll let them do that privately afterwards, so you're free to come down, uh, introduce yourself to Greg, and ask another question. Um, it's always been a pleasure having you at Grove City, both as a student, and now what a thrill for, it, for us it is to have you back here as a guest speaker, sharing with all of our students that are currently here at Grove City. Can we give him a warm round of applause? And thank you. And I, I see you've given Mark Sotomayor a little more product placement here at the end. So uh, thank you for being with us. Have a great night, everybody, and we'll see you soon.